Hello, my name is Dr. Matt Cap, and in this video, we're going to have a look at how we plan for quality differentiated teaching practice in relation to the Australian curriculum science using the Universal Design for Learning framework. There are a number of steps involved in developing quality differentiated teaching practice. They are teachers working collaboratively. There's significant research out there that shows that when teachers work collaboratively, they become better at their um, profession and they're more accurate in terms of the use of um, the curriculum and more targeted in the strategies they use. And it ensures consistency of practice between classrooms. The next step is that teachers collaboratively need to deconstruct the Australian curriculum in terms of the content descriptors and the achievement standards. They need to, in relation to the content descriptors and achievement standards, once they've deconstructed those, they need to identify the common characteristics of the students in their classroom. Once they've identified the common characteristics, they need to discern the strengths and functional impacts associated with those common characteristics. Then knowing the strengths and functional impacts of their students, they need to identify teaching strategies that are explicitly tied to their students' strengths and functional impacts. And the Universal Design for Learning Framework supports teachers in this problem solving process. Then they need to embed both the deconstructed Australian curriculum and the UDL aligned strategies into the explicit instruction or direct instruction model. And we're going to have a look at this video and how to do this process. So the steps in deconstructing the Australian curriculum are to identify the relevant content descriptors and achievement standards that are going to be deconstructed. So then the first step is to deconstruct the content descriptors to identify the essential knowledge and skills. Teachers then need to identify the associated achievement standards that students will de demonstrate, evidence of learning against, and identify any relevant cognitive verbs and important terminology in the achievement standards. The teachers then go to the Australian Curriculum website and define the cognitive verbs and um, important terminology to work out what the students actually need to demonstrate and not demonstrate as evidence of learning against those achievement standards. So let's go through this process and look at how we do it. So when we think about Australian Curriculum Science, we're going to focus on Year 7. So the first step is to identify the content descriptors that teachers will teach and model for the students because the content descriptors in the Australian curriculum are what teachers teach and model and the achievement standards are what students provide evidence of learning against. So the first step is to go to the Australian curriculum website for science and identify year seven, go to the content descriptors and identify what the teachers are gonna teach the students. When they've identified the content descriptors, it's really important to start to deconstruct those. So in this example video, we've identified a number of content descriptors that we're going to teach and model for the students. Knowing the content descriptors and what they're asking us to teach is really important because that helps us deconstruct and identify what is the essential knowledge that we're gonna contextualize for our learners and what is the essential skills that we're gonna model because there's a tendency as teachers is to add superfluous things to the teaching process, either because I've taught science for a long time or you know I love teaching science and these things are valuable to me, so I'm gonna teach them to the students. But if they're not in the approved curriculum, because we know that the Australian curriculum is written in a developmental way, that these might be barriers to the learning process. So once we've identified the content descriptors, we need to start deconstructing them to identify the essential knowledge and the essential skills. To do this, we can go to the elaborations and have a look at what they tell us. We don't have to cover it all because there's a lot there, but it gives us ideas about the essential knowledge and skills. Once we look at the elaborations, we can start to deconstruct those content descriptors into those knowledge and skills. So once I've looked at those three content descriptors, I've worked out what is the essential knowledge that I need to contextualize for my learners. Going back to the elaborations and back to the content descriptors, I can work out then what is the essential skills I need to model for my students. <laughs> 
This is really important because when we think about the explicit instruction model, we contextualize the knowledge for our learners. Then we model for the students the essential skills. We model it independently as a teacher. As we model those skills, we're talking out of cognitive thoughts so the students can see what we're doing and hear what we're saying so they can connect our internal thoughts with what we're demonstrating. Then we do it with our students. So we model again, this time involving our students in that process. So once we've identified the relevant content descriptors and we've deconstructed those into the essential knowledge and skills, we need to identify the associated achievement standards. We go to the Australian Curriculum website, always going to the website because it's the latest up-to-date version of the curriculum because we're up to version 8.4. There is a risk that if we go to other things, we might be working off an older version of the document or we might be working off something that was created by someone that might not be tied to the current version of the curriculum. So we go to the Australian Curriculum website, identify Year 7 science, and we look at the achievement standards, and we discern the achievement standards that are connected to the content descriptors that we're teaching. You've got to be really careful because the way that the Australian Curriculum is written is sometimes the content descriptors that we teach aren't actually assessed in the year that they're taught. They actually might be assessed in the next year because it might not be developmentally appropriate for students to provide evidence of learning at this time against those content descriptors. So it's really important that we have a good understanding of the Australian Curriculum website. So I've looked at the Australian Curriculum Achievement Standards, thinking about my content descriptors, and I've identified two achievement standards that I'm going to get students to demonstrate evidence of learning against. Once I've identified those achievement standards, I need to start to deconstruct them to work out what is it essentially that the students need to provide evidence of learning against. There is a risk that there's a barrier to the learning process if we add things to these achievement standards that aren't explicitly there. To deconstruct them, we need to follow a number of steps. So the first step is to identify in the achievement standards the cognitive verbs. So those verbs that are associated with cognitive processes that the students will develop demonstrate as evidence of learning and I've highlighted these yellow so it's I find it really important if you look for the cognitive verbs in the achievement stand and you highlight them then you also need to look for what is that essential key terminology what are those essential things that students need to demonstrate evidence of learning against to say that they're at standard against this year seven Australian curriculum science and I've highlighted those green Then we start to go to the Australian Curriculum website, looking at the glossary, defining what those cognitive verbs mean and any essential terminology. So the first thing we do is we go back to the website and we look at understand how science works. We click on it and it will open up a drop down box. We go to the very bottom of the box, find the glossary, click on that hyperlink and look for either the cognitive verbs or the key terminology so we can define them. In this achievement, these achievement standards classify it as one cognitive verb. So I identify that and I look for the definition. So from my experience working with these glossaries, if you go to the science glossary, for example, and you can't find a cognitive verb or a key term, I then go to the HPE glossary because they have many of the cognitive verbs. If it's not there, I go to the QCAA website and look at their definitions of the cognitive verbs. Remembering that in the Australian curriculum, they use Bloom's taxonomy, whereas QCAA uses Mazzano's um, cognitive verbs. So you just got to be a little bit careful. And then if they're not in any of those essential documents, your teaching team need to collaboratively define them. But I always start with the glossary of the learning area. If it's not there, go to the glossary of HP. If it's not there, you might look at other key um, learning areas in the Australian curriculum. If you still can't find it, go to QCAA and look at their definitions. If they don't have a definition, your teaching team need to collaboratively define it. I emphasize collaboration because everyone needs to have a clear agreement on the terminology because if you don't you're going to be looking at different things and teaching different things to your students and that could be a barrier to the learning process so let's have a look back at those achievement standards 
I've identified the four cognitive verbs, predict, classify, organize, and communicate. And I've actually gone to the glossaries and defined those because if we don't understand what they mean, we could actually be looking for different things from our students or teaching different skills that actually aren't explicitly required in that achievement standard. We then define the key terminology. So in this case, what human changes are we looking for? What environmental changes? What we mean by interactions between organisms? What observable means? Because there's a tendency to sometimes just assume what the curriculum is actually asking rather than going back to it as a source document. If we talk about the word observable, we might be thinking about what we only what we see, but as you can see in that definition, it's actually much broader than that. What we mean by scientific language in relation to these content descriptors and achievement standards and what appropriate representations mean. So if the glossary terminology um, don't provide us that, we can go back to the content descriptor and look at the elaborations and they can help flesh out for us those achievement standards. So now we've got to work out what our students need to demonstrate as evidence of learning to be at stand against those achievement standards. Using that deconstructed content descriptors and achievement standards, I've worked out what my students in my year seven science class need to demonstrate to be at standard against those achievement standards. Thinking about, we also need to provide opportunities to demonstrate above and think about how we're gonna support those students who are struggling. So once we've deconstructed the curriculum, because research suggests that incorrect use of the approved curriculum could be the first barrier to the learning process, next process we need to follow is to think about the students in our class. So we need to think about the learners in our classroom. The first thing we need to do when we're thinking about a class is think about what are the common characteristics we see within that group of learners. We're not thinking about individuals because when we think about individuals, we start to move from quality differentiated teaching practice or universal design for learning into differentiated instruction or you might say that tier two and tier three model of the response to intervention model. So we need to think about what are the common characteristics we see in our learners. Once we think about those common characteristics, we need to discern what are the strengths associated with those common characteristics that we see in our learners and what are the functional impacts? Another word for functional impact might be barrier. We use the term functional impact because that's what we see in the nationally consistent collection of data for students with disability. Once we've identified those, we then start to problem solve around pedagogical strategies that we can use to support our learners to overcome those barriers to the learning process and harness those strengths. And that's where the universal design for learning framework comes in. So let's have a look at how we do that. So I always find that thinking about three common characteristics is a good way to start. So if I think about my class, I've got kids with different levels of reading a comprehension. I've got kids with different levels of engagement. And I've got a large number of students who um, don't have English as a first language. So they're the common characteristics. So once we thought about those common characteristics, we then need to start to think about strengths. So for those kids with different levels of reading comprehension, some students demonstrate really high levels of comprehension strategies that they've internalized. So they've got those lifelong learning skills. In terms of different levels of engagement, some students are really enthusiastic, but enthusiastic about specific areas of interest. In relation to English as a sec, um, first language, I, I sorry, second language, I couldn't think of any associated with strengths, but we can, um, it's really important to start with those strengths because if we always focus on the negativity, there's a tendency to spiral into our, a negative mindset. So once we've identified those common characteristics and associated strength, we then need to think about what are the potential functional impacts of those common characteristics. So for kids with different levels of reading comprehension, some have difficulties reading more complex texts in English and some misunderstand content in text. So for those kids with different levels of reading ability, some are, have a lot to say about other things, reluctant writers, misinstruction, they miss content, can be anxious, and they can be reluctant to show teachers what um, the student can do. And for those kids who English 
is not their first language. Some have difficulties reading more complex texts in English, um, some misunderstanding of content and misunderstanding of instructions. Notice rather than identifying all these different things we need to focus on, when we look at our strength and functional impact, there's actually a lot of crossover. So rather than focusing on 30 different things in my classroom, I've identified what are the essential strengths of my student and what are those essential functional impacts that we're going to focus on and thinking about taking our strategies and targeting them to those. In relation to the nationally consistent collection of data for students with disability, which is a funding model for schools, we can use this process to identify students' functional impacts at that quality differentiated teaching practice level. So by doing, um, we do this by identifying the functional impacts that relate to students with disability, and we can just put their initials to show that we're mapping out their functional impacts. I always use initials because if you write their full name of a student and it's kind of gets left on a teacher's desk or something, you've got a breach of confidentiality. So I always use their initials. So in this case, with different levels of reading comprehension and different levels of engagement, I've identified the functional impacts for MJ and AB, who are students with disability in my class. Notice that I haven't put any initials down here around English as a um, not being a first language because the NCCD is about students with disability, not about other students who receive personalized learning in our classes. And there are a lot of students who receive personalized learning, but the NCCD is specifically about disability. Now that we've identified our common characteristics, our associated strengths and functional impacts, we need to problem solve around strategies that we can tie to those. And this is where the UDL framework comes, becomes very useful. The UDL framework is not a set of strategies, but a problem solving tool that when we think about our students' strengths and functional impacts, we can look at the framework and problem around, solve around strategies that can be used to target those. If um, you're like many teachers who find that this is a bit cumbersome, you can actually, there's a great website called the UDL Goalbook Act that gives you thousands of strategies that are tied to the UDL framework. You could look through some of those strategies and there's probably a lot of strategies that you've tried before and take those and connect those to your students' strengths and functional impacts. So let's look at how we do that now. So for students who have different levels of reading comprehension and some students demonstrate really high levels of comprehension and other students struggled with more comp on texts and misunderstand the content in those texts. We could use lots of visuals and concrete materials. We could use e-readers or um, immersive reading in OneNote. We could do joint readings, highlighting nouns, verbs, and objects, um, different colors. We could highlight different difficult words in text and then look for contextual clues within that text. And if we can't find it, shoot that word into Google Images and have a look at what the word um, pictures are and come up with a definition together, create some mind maps, Freya models and Venn diagrams, or do some joint writing using colored scaffolds. But these are targeted strategies because we've thought about the common characteristics of our students, their associated strengths and functional impacts. Around different levels of engagement, some students are very enthusiastic, others have a lot to say about other topics, reluctant writers, misinstructions, miscontent can be anxious and reluctant show teachers what they can do. We could write the instructions on the whiteboard if students miss, we could film our modeling and send it to students, we could use a visual schedule, we could use an if then reward strategy. If you do this, then you get this reward, provide students with any PowerPoint used in the class, or we could use speech to text software or dictation in OneNote. For kids who um, English is not their first language, and so they struggle with those more complex texts in English and misunderstand content and instructions, we could once again look very similar characteristics to those students who struggle with um, reading comprehension. So what that means is we're not doing 30 different things for 30 different students. We're actually identifying what are those targeted teaching strategies that we could use to support our learners. The only difference for this um, students for whom English isn't a first language, we could actually allow them in OneNote to take an English text, convert it to their first language, read it, and then come back to English to help clarify that understanding. So now that we've identified the content descriptors we're going to teach and model, the achievement standards students are going to demonstrate, and we've deconstructed those, 
We've thought about our common characteristics, strengths and functional impacts and problem solved around targeted strategies. We now need to embed all of this into the explicit instruction model. So we know that Vygotsky and others talk about the importance of contextualizing knowledge, then modeling for the students, me independently talking out my cognitive thoughts. So students can see what I'm doing and hear what I'm saying so they can connect what I'm thinking to what I'm doing and then doing it with the students, pretending you could pretend that you forgot what to do and ask them to help out. Moving into group work where students work collaboratively and then independent work. So it's kind of a cycle. So what we need to do is we need to take everything we've deconstructed up to now and put it into this model. So the, when in the contextualization area, we think about the essential knowledge from the content descriptors that we've deconstructed and we put it into this part of the lesson sequence. This wouldn't be one lesson. It might be a week of lessons. It might be a month of lessons. Whilst it's a generic approach this framework, you could put it into whatever sort of planning document you use. In the teacher modeling, we take the essential skills from the content descriptors and put them in there. During the, and we can see the essential knowledge and the essential skills from the modeling. We then take the evidence of learning from the achievement standards. And this is what the students demonstrate whilst they're working in groups, because you want them working towards the achievement standard because everything is then evidence of learning to make judgment against the approved curriculum. If you've got the kids working towards the content descriptors, it provides you no evidence of learning for them. And we take in that from what we deconstructed earlier. Then we do the same with the independent work. So we've now worked out and deconstructed the curriculum and worked out what we're going to teach. So we're going to contextualize that essential knowledge. We're going to model independently and with the students, the essential skills. Then during group work and independent work, the students are working towards essentially what the achievement standards are asking, what need, not, not what teachers believe they need to do, but going back to the achievement standards and deconstructing them. Now we've done that for curriculum. We've also got to do it for our targeted teaching strategies. So we during the contextualization stage, we go back to the strategies that we've identified and we identify what would be useful during the contextualization of knowledge, because not all of the strategies that we identified will be useful all the time. So we put them into there and we put them into that stage of the gradual release or explicit instruction model. We then think about when I'm modeling the skills independently, and then with the students, what are those strategies that would be useful for breaking down those barriers to the learning process? And we put them into that element of the explicit instruction model. I then think about when the students are working in groups and independently, what strategies would be useful? Notice that during each one of those stages, of the explicit instruction model, the strategies change because the strategies are not always gonna be useful. When I'm contextualizing the knowledge, the strategies I use there will be different to the strategies I use when I'm modeling a skill. When the students are working in groups, the strategies that will be useful for breaking down barriers to the learning process there will be different to when they're working independently. So that's the process by which we develop universally designed or quality differentiated teaching practice lessons at that tier one, element of the response to intervention model because research shows that if we don't have good inclusive first teaching at that tier one level we might move into tier two and three but they won't work because tier one good first teaching might have been all that is needed so hopefully you found this video useful of how to do the process i'd strongly encourage you to look at the rest of our social media pages looking for more of these videos. And if you're interested in us at Capitalize Education, developing some of those instructional videos for your staff, reach out to us, contact us on our social media pages. We're always happy to work with other teachers. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.